With that cross, Lord, I'm in love. I'm in love, oh. I'm in love. I'm in love, oh. This is a good place to pray in the Holy Ghost. Wherever you are, pray in the Holy Ghost. This is a good place to pray in the Holy Ghost. Can you lift up your voice and pray in the Holy Ghost? Just in case you are not yet baptized with the evidence of speaking in tongues, then you are free to pray in your understanding. But if you can pray in the Holy Ghost, now is a good time to pray in the Holy Ghost. Udaba kabo kabilando sababababa. Just in case you are not aware, God is in the midst of us already. Open your mouth and pray in the Holy Ghost. Sababababa bara kabala kade. Lande bara te bo kabala sata. Inda kabola de praso de badia da bara da bas. Apo po 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 po. It's not a time to look around. Close your eyes. Lift up your voice. Pray in the Holy Ghost. You have sung songs. Can you now lift up your voice in worship? Kabele makobalata. Shaba ba 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 ba. Ete baraka tele kabolate. Lika bola kabria sota bilatai. Le parwa sambala tola bariat. Le pa 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 pa. Lika bola kabele kabila tobre saniati. Shabola bila no bradi bai. Oh, kabele makuba. Shaba ba 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 ba. Le kresu susa. Ende la bariat nosa. Shabala bala botela. Le pa 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 pa. I'm in love with no other but the great one. My love is for him alone. Come in Somebody pray. Open your mouth. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Mandele mano bra sala baba, sala baba 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 baba, sala bala kabola diati, abora de badi aboda baja, man baba 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 baba, le kabola ni bra sada. Feel free to travel, feel free to go the distance, feel free to look upon his face, feel free to express your heart. But don't stand there and close your mouth. It's a time to open your lips and allow your worship break forth like a fresh spring in the morning. Abarata para nereba, saleba la kobaya. Oh. Oh yes, we're getting there now. We're getting there now. We become one man in the spirit. We become one man in the spirit. Somebody worship that the reality of his presence might indeed flood this house. Jesus, now is your time. Open up your heart. Open up 
open up your mouth and bless his name. Bless his name. Bless his name. Bless his name. Go to that place in the spirit where it is just you and the Lord. It's just you and the Lord. It's just you and the Lord. Indeed, he rises. He rises with healing in his wings. He comes upon us like a mighty rushing wind. He breathes upon us the breath of life. For indeed, these dry bones shall live again. Indeed, these dry bones shall rise a mighty army. Oh yes! Oh yes! Oh thou forsaken of Jacob, thy king calleth thee. He calleth thee to honor. He calleth thee to peace. He calleth thee to favor. He calleth thee to righteousness. Oh, Holy be glorified forever, Jesus. Mande bora kabela Jesus. in our generation is the fact that the average believer is not able to discern the movements of the Holy Spirit either within their vessel or in their own space that is their own lives or even as relates to what it is God is doing 
in their generation, their nation, or whatever it is. But the Bible speaks of a generation of people or a company of people who were called the sons of Issachar. The Bible says they were able to discern. They understood what it was that the Lord was doing. And on the basis of that understanding, they were able to give Israel direction. I want you to pray that in this season that we are seeking the Lord for consecration, your life will not be aimless. Your life will not be characterized by confusion. I want you to beg God, Lord, open my eyes that I may see. Open my ears that I may hear. Walk upon my heart that I may understand. So that, oh God, I will know what it is you are doing in me, with me, for me. Open your mouth and pray now. Open your mouth and pray now. For the next 15 minutes, Lord, open my eyes that I may see. Open my ears that I may hear. Walk upon my heart that I may understand. So that I know what it is that you are doing. That you are doing. That you are doing. That you are doing. This year, oh God, I refuse to be blind. This year, oh God, I refuse to be deaf. This year, oh God, I refuse to be confused. This year, go. Open your mouth and pray. Open your mouth and pray. You are praying for yourself. No man has known the mind of God that he might instruct him. But the Bible says he has been the mind of God has been revealed to us by his spirit. By his spirit. What to do, where to go, where to school, who to marry, where to invest, how to live. Lord, let this be the year that my life is so accurate that I'm in so much alignment that my life becomes the definition of how it is to walk with God. Open my eyes that I may see. Open my ears that I may hear. Walk upon my heart that I may understand. Abarakabo kaba kaba. Shada ba 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 ba. Ekabola kaba. What happens to a blind man is that he falls into a ditch. 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 I refuse to fall this year. I refuse to stumble this year. I refuse to walk in error this year. Lord, open my eyes. The Bible speaks of Hagar. She was running away from her mistress with her baby. And she got into the desert place. The Bible says she was about to die of thirst. Her baby was about to die of thirst. But the Bible says the Lord opened her eyes. And she saw a well. And she drank. The well was her survivor, but it came by the opening of her eyes. Lord, open my eyes to understand your patterns, to understand your provision, to see your supply, to know how to walk, to know how to stand, to know when to run, to know when to sit. Lord, open my eyes. Marabakaba, etapapapa. Raka bola kabele de brasana mando ade baba baba ba le kabola kabila to bres ate barataba ande baba baba e kaboka bala ato balate if you don't feel like praying you can sit down and cross your leg just feel free you are in your father's house but those of you that understand that it is not in a man to guide his own ways and to direct his paths you will beg god that lord I refuse to be blind. I made so many mistakes last year, but not this year. Not this year. My life will not be by guesswork. My life will be by precision. Are you not tired when people ask you? What is it about your life? And you are not able to say this is what the Lord said. Aparate and the Kaboda Baria Shada Barataba Yaya.
Come on, dear sister, pray. Come on, dear sister, pray. Forget about the person by your side. You don't know why they came to service. Some came to look. Some came to be excited. But we, in this month, in these 21 days, we are desperate to find God. How is it that men before us were able to live? How is it that they were able to live? Baria tebako, basa papa pa, kabala barata baba, sana manda kaluas, ya barande kaluas. Wherever you are, pray. It's a personal matter. Blessed is the man. Blessed is the man that the Lord chooses to help. And when God wants to help a man, one of the first things that he does is that he opens your eyes so that you may see. He opens your ears so that you may hear. Then he walks upon your heart that you may understand. When God wants to judge a people, you will hear him say to his prophet that seeing they will not perceive, hearing they will not know, and with their hearts they will not understand. May we not be a cursed generation. May we not be that generation that has seen yet we can't perceive. We cannot understand. We have ears but we do not hear. Beg God, beg God. Lord, help my eyesight. Some of you have never understood what it means to walk with God accurately. God is about to initiate you into a season of accurate labors, accurate journeys. Alabakabo, ede ba 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 ba, rakobela, isamenane, liba ba ba ba, ede baria rwa rwa. Some of you are already on the journey. Don't make the same mistakes your father's made. The same mistakes your mother made. It's because we are blind. It's because we are deaf. It's because our hearts are afflicted with trust. But tonight is that night. I saw the angel of the Lord washing eyes with eyes. I saw the angel of the Lord feeding men with a meal. And he said, this meal will open your senses. Oh, yeah! Oh, yeah, yeah! The Lord took me in the spirit this afternoon. I even began to see the tent. The tent that the Lord said he will build in this city. Oh, yeah, Pura. 
Somebody, your eyes are opening now. Your spiritual eyes are opening now. It will be like fire. They are opening now. If your name is Chite, I kept seeing that name Chite. While I prayed, I kept seeing the name Chite. If your name is Chite, tonight is your night. Online, on site. If your name is Chite, I saw a darkness that the Lord broke over of your life. I ebara, etapora. Some of you are not able to, you have prayed and prayed and prayed. Your family has not changed. It's because you don't know the root of the problem. God is about to open your eyes. I I see you 
in the beauty of nature you shine all around you are everything everything is you precious jesus i want to you in prayer so shall it be that indeed in seeing we see in hearing we hear and in understanding our hearts understand blindness, spiritual blindness physical and spiritual blindness physical and spiritual deafness are banished from this company forever in the name of Jesus every heart that has been clogged with many things such that that heart is unable to understand tonight oh God because we have cried to you in prayer and you have promised to answer Lord let today be the day that every heart gains understanding in the name of Jesus and by the time this year comes to a close Lord, our mouths will be filled with testimonies. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' awesome name, we have prayed. Come on, I said in Jesus' name, we have prayed. Be seated if you can. Oh, glory to God. Welcome tonight to tonight's Bible study. We trust Jesus. That what it is the Lord wants to say to us will find expression and be a blessing to all of us in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you came with your Bible, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we begin at verse 1. Just so you are aware, for those of you who are coming in today for the first time, we're on a 21 days fast. And the consequence of that is that we are meeting every day in the tent to seek the face of the Lord in prayer. And during the week, we meet at 4 o'clock and we pray till 7. And on Sunday like this, we meet at 3.30 to engage the word and also to pray. And if you've been around since the first day, I've been showing us, since Monday the 10th, I've been showing us the postures of the consecrated man. Began by explaining to us that the first posture of the consecrated man is that he gives his life to God as a gift. He gives his life to God as a gift. The giving of his life. The implication of that is that the one who chooses to walk with the Lord recognizes that even though 
he lives in the visible realm and he has rights, he has privileges that are accrued to him as a consequence of the fact that he still draws breath. He recognizes that he has to surrender his life in totality to God. So by an act of his will, by a deliberate decision of his own heart, he chooses to relinquish his rights and his privileges and says, God, I am yours. So the first posture of the man who walks with God in consecration is that he gives his life as a gift. And then we moved on from there and we looked at the second posture of the consecrated man. And the second posture we called to be yoked with him. We went to the third and we talked about being joined with the Lord. And the fourth we looked at, we said it is to drink of his cup. If you want the details of those teachings, each of them are on our telegram handle. Now I engage the face of the Lord thinking that I will be able to advance tonight on that pathway. But the Lord told me that I had to open what it is exactly that consecration models in scripture. What are actually the demands of consecration? And why is consecration demanded? And what is the posture that the man who understands consecration needs to take as he begins to advance on those various dimensions of the consecrated life? And as I ask God questions, he now gave me this scripture. But before I begin to read this scripture, I need to say to us that if you are a student of the Bible, you will know that the Bible particularly mentions various civilizations that are possible for the mortal in the visible realm. And by civilizations, I mean that there are various governments that are available in the visible realm that a mortal can choose to submit to by an act of his or her will. The first civilization most likely will be the civilization into which we are born. And if you were here last Sunday, I tried to explain that civilization to us in detail. And that is the city or the spiritual civilization that we call Egypt. Every mortal is born into that spirit city called Egypt. The beginning of our spiritual journey always begins by an escape, a deliverance from Egypt. So, once you are leaving Egypt, the question will now be, if I leave Egypt, where is my destination? If you've ever read Hebrews, the Bible says we have come to where? Mount Zion. So on the one hand, you have a spirit city that is called Egypt. You also have a spirit city that is called what? Zion. And the Bible says that Zion is the city of who? The living God. The living God. It is where God has decided to put his name. It is where God has decided to establish his government. It is where the throne of God is domiciled. So our deliverance from Egypt is predicated on the fact that God's intent is to successfully cause us to journey from Egypt to Zion. Where we join the company of the redeemed. Where we join the company of men who have decided to surrender their lives to Jesus. If you are a student of the Bible, you will know that God used Israel to model that journey. Israel. The whole enterprise with Israel in scripture was to model the journey of the deliverance from Egypt to the establishment in Zion. And one of the aspects of that journey that is critical for every believer to carefully x-ray and understand is the aspect where the Lord begins to speak to Israel and say, I have chosen you among all the nations. So first separation that occurs in scripture is that the Lord separates Israel from all the nations. The second separation that occurs in scripture is that God now separates a tribe from all of Israel. He chooses Levi and separates Levi from the other 11 tribes. The last separation that occurs is 
that Levi in himself, even though he is separated from the leaven, not every Levite is now drawn into the final separation, which is now called being consecrated unto the Lord. So in Levi, you now find that the Bible now says that not every Levite will be qualified to actually serve in the Lord's system. So after he has separated Israel first, he now separated Levi from Israel. He now separated a company of men and he called them what? Priests. And these priests that were separated from Levi, their assignment was that they were to be separated unto the Lord. Why did God separate Israel from the other nations? God wanted to use Israel to model what God is like. Because every time you enter into a civilization, your life is mandated to mirror the spirit that is at work in that civilization. So if you, if you are in Egypt, the spirit of Egypt will be the government over your life. And it's expected that when you are in Zion, the spirit of Zion should be the government over your life. So God brought Israel out of Egypt with the intent that he will use Israel to show people the, a different kind of spirit that works in a different kind of people. And as he attempted to carry out that work, he realized that carrying all of them along might not be necessarily feasible. So he chose a tribe, and from that tribe, he chose a special set of people. And these people, they were chosen on the basis of the fact that they were not the ones that chose God first. God chose them. And that is to mirror the fact that in salvation, salvation does not begin with your decision. Salvation begins with God's decision. God decided to make provision for you to be able to choose him. It is fully. It is an overestimation of yourself. To think that your work with God. Or your, your salvation experience. Is a product of a decision. Only a product of a decision you decided to make in a service. Before you were able to make that decision. Provision had been made for that decision to be possible. Without which, if that provision did not exist, you would not have been able to choose God. So God chooses from Levi certain individuals and he says that your assignment basically is that you will be consecrated where? Unto me. But by the time you now begin to study scriptures, you will now find out that it is possible for a priest who has been chosen unto God, consecrated unto God, to choose to break his consecration and go after the mundane things that are available to the common man. If you've read your Bible, you will know that the Bible says that if we go to 1 Peter chapter 2, okay, let's go there. 1 Peter chapter 2, let's begin at verse 4. 1 Peter chapter 2, I think verse 4 will be our entry point. Um, let me see 2, verse 2. No, five. Aha. Uh -huh. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now, when we speak about priesthood, what is the difference between a priest and priesthood? Because those two things are not the same. They're not the same. Here the Bible is not speaking about the priests particularly. He's speaking about what? The priesthood. And when we talk about priesthood, we are talking about a combination of the priest, the tabernacle, and the laws that govern the activity of the priest. That's what we call the priesthood. It is a system that God designed for men who are consecrated unto him. The priest, the tabernacle, and the laws that govern the activity of the priest is what we call the priesthood. So the priest himself is an item of the priesthood. 
And if you were here some weeks ago, I taught you that in the new covenant, there is a shift from what we saw in the old. In the old, the priest was different, the tabernacle was different, and the offering was different. But in the new covenant, the priest, the tabernacle, and the offering are one. Are you here? So in the new covenant, you are both the priest, you are the place of the offering, and you are also the offering. So everything God was doing in the Old, Old Testament was to bring us to this point to understand that every one of us joined together as a company of believers. We are as lively stones being built together to be a spiritual house and we are a holy priesthood. That word holy there does not mean clean. Are you here? Because the average believer when he sees the word holy, what comes to his mind is clean. Or what comes to his mind is pure. You cannot be holy without being clean and pure. But holiness is not just being clean and pure. The word holy means to be cut out from. To be separate. So he says that you are a separate priesthood. You are not like the priesthood that exists in other civilizations. You are consecrated unto the Lord. And your assignment is to offer what? Spiritual sacrifice. Go to verse 9. Verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation. Meaning like I was trying to emphasize. It's not premised on you first. It begins with the Lord. He chose you. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. His own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into where? The marvelous light. Indicative of the fact that you are called out of one civilization into another civilization. So it is now important for the believer to sit down and try and understand if I belong to a priesthood. And in this case, it means that as part of the body and as an individual, I am a priest, I am the offering, and I am the place of the offering. If I have been called to such a civilization, what are the burdens of the Lord concerning the priest? It means that if you are going to survive on that journey from Egypt to Zion, the mode that the Lord expects you to sustain is the mood of the priest. But you see what happens is this. Many people are not able to make it to Mount Zion. Not because grace has not been made available. But because there are many distractions. This is where the other civilizations now come into play. On that journey to Zion. One prominent civilization in scriptures is called Babylon. Babylon. And if you've ever read of Babylon described in scriptures, the representation of Babylon is the representation of the world system. Everything that is against God, everything that tries to fight God is the spirit that Babylon portrays. Everything anti-God is the spirit of Babylon. And one of the scriptures that strikes my heart about Babylon, I don't want to read the Old Testament. But one that strikes my heart is in Revelations 17. Revelation 17. Let's go to verse 4. Stay with me, I'm going somewhere. The woman, remember, I have told you many times that when you read scriptures, you need to come to the Bible with the understanding that the Bible is a book of metaphors. There are many metaphors that are used in scripture that you need to take time to understand. We don't have the time to do that now. But it says here, the woman, this was not speaking about a physical woman in that sense. Remember, this was a revelation that was being showed unto John the Beloved. It says the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, Having in her hand a what? Golden cup. 
And what was this cup full of? Abominations and the filthiness of her what? Now remember that the symbol that is used here is that of a woman. And if you were here, I think it's Thursday or Friday, can't remember. I showed you that there are three metaphors that are used to describe the relationship between God and the Christian. First metaphor is father and son. Second metaphor is king and servant. Third metaphor is husband and wife. Now, the reason the Bible speaks about fornication here is not that the woman was physically going to sleep around. It was speaking of the fact that this was a city that did not understand covenant. A person that did not understand covenant did not know what it meant to be true. To have fidelity. To be consecrated and separated unto one. That's what marriage is. Marriage is me looking at my wife and saying, even though there will be other women alive, I have separated myself unto you. Meaning that it's just like mobile phones. You can marry the queen of England or, or the, the, the most beautiful girl in Nigeria today. But if you've ever heard the speakings of, of the Englishman, he tells us that the beautiful ones are not yet born. So if your marriage is based on beauty, it means that every time there is a new product, you will be confused. That's how the average believer lives. At the slightest appearing of a new product, he no longer knows why he chose the first product in the first place. That's how some of you come under pressure. You bought your Redmi Note 5. And the day you bought it, you walked majestically to your house. You felt you had arrived. Then two months later, you were watching TV and they said, Note 6 Pro has come out. And all of a sudden, a sense of dissatisfaction and a sense of depression hits your heart. You look at your phone, you look, say, why person go they suffer? Like, no, no, no. The problem is this, because you, you did not understand why you bought that in the first place and you don't recognize where you are coming from. You forgot that just six months ago, you were still struggling with torchlight and the Lord showed you great mercy and you bought this one. But all of a sudden, because you have seen an upgraded version, you forget the reason why you, how you even got to that place in the first place. And every time you see things like that, the root cause is a spirit, is driven by a city. That city is called what? Babylon. Babylon is the one that throws things in front of you, trying to give you the impression that except you amass more, you will never be satisfied. So Babylon gives you the impression that more is better. More is better. And this is what production companies prey on. It's a, it's a spirit of Babylon. So they bring out Toyota 2021 model. And then everybody rushes to buy it. Then they change the front headlight, change the back headlight, and call it 2022 full option. Then the man that bought the 2021 is under pressure. That he needs to make a statement because this is the upgraded version. In the things of God, upgrade, upgrade does not necessarily mean better. In the things of the spirit, upgrade is not necessary unless God determines that it's so. So it means that in the things of the spirit, the, the word that the Lord gave you in 2012 can still be the speakings of the Lord for you in 2022. It is this madness, this craving for an upgrade, in quote, that everywhere you go, there is a team for the year. Is this quest for upgrade? I was traveling to Hawichi yesterday and I saw a billboard for their crossover service. And the team was, I must cross the line. Malaboko. I must cross the line. The whole idea is that there is something that is missing. The idea that drives Babylon is that Babylon wants the mortal to feel that God is not enough. Ha, ha, ha. That if God is all that you have, God is not enough. That's the spirit of Babylon. Go to the next verse. He says, and on her forehead, a name was written. So you now understand why he used the symbol of a woman. He was not speaking about a woman. He said, 
the name of that, that metaphor that you saw is that mystery. Babylon the Great. The mother of harlots and of so every abomination you find on the earth, the mother is who? Babylon. Babylon. Stay with me. Stay with me. So on your journey from Egypt to Zion, one of the things that will, that will attack you is the spirit of Babylon. Babylon seeks to exert her government over you. So that throughout your life, you will not know that blessed satisfaction that comes from having sweet fellowship with Jesus. So when Jesus begins to teach in Matthew 6 that you should take no thought for your life, what you should eat, what you should drink, and what you should put on. But you should seek ye first the kingdom of God. Jesus is giving you a warning that there are other civilizations that are present in the earth realm. And if you don't free yourself from certain appetites and desires, you will come under the slavery of that appetite, of that spirit. Babylon is at work even now. Even now. And I'm coming to 2 Timothy 3. Gently. It's at work even now. And the average believer is a victim of that spirit. God is not afraid of your success. God is not determined to make you a failure. God is not, is not, is, he has not um, set himself up to make his, his children to suffer. Lack and, 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 and just be hungry and be looking like, like, uh, um, like crazy people on the road. No. But what God wants to do is that whether you are rich or you are poor, it no longer matters to you. If you have him. And there is no place in the Bible where the Lord tells you that the, the major um, consequence of your salvation is that God will make you rich for the rest of your life. There is no place in the Bible. And it's Bible study. Huh? When you get home, you can flip through the scripture. When you come next Sunday, you can raise your hand and say, I found one. Then we will open it. I will now show you that it's a lie. Mm. Because that scripture you are thinking about, I've read it. That one, that one. I've read it. I've read it. I will now show you that it's a lie. We will now begin at the first verse. Because you know the Bible was not reading, written in verses and chapters. It was a prose. Continuous. So if you jump to verse 6. And you now begin to want to say. This is what. No, no, no. Let's, let's go to the root. Then when we get to the root. I will now show you what the preacher. Or the person that wrote it was talking about. There's no scripture in, in, in the Bible. What the Lord promises. Is that if you stay with him. He knows what your needs are. And he will meet them. He will meet them. He will. He promises that there will not be anyone amongst us that is poor, lacking. That does not mean every one of us will be rich. It means that those who have will have enough to take care of those who don't have. Such that every one of us is comfortable. That's what he's promised in scripture. So Babylon will throw up her goods. And yet, this person is doing everything to please people. So people even borrow now to do their hair. Oh, you don't know. They, bo they borrow now to do her. They, uh, 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 they go to church. And if you go to church like this, you know, you know the spirit that is walking is Babylon. So they borrow. So some people that are sitting in church this evening now, 
are wondering why they are owing so much money. Mm. But by the time you look at the things they borrowed money for, you will be ashamed. You know why? Babylon is the spirit of pressure. He keeps telling you there is something you are missing. So you hear even Christians saying, I'm trying to meet up. Meet up with what? Who set the standard? Wait first. Let's, let's be honest. Who set the standard? You know, dear brother, somebody wants to marry and they are on the ground begging God, Daddy, give me money for cake. Wait first, wait. Cake. So if you don't have money for cake, you won't marry. Babylon. Oh, you are laughing now. You won't marry. People go to Facebook and they see people's pre-wedding photo shoot. They are now under pressure. Wait first. Have you ever asked yourself, who set the standard? You know, Christians don't ask questions. Anything that is trending, they just follow. Who set this? Who told you that before you do your wedding, you must do pre-wedding photo shoot? You won't like me. I told you this, this month, you won't like me. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a marketing manager. I'm a preacher of Jesus. Mm. I'm not selling a product. I'm, I'm, I'm teaching you truth. Who set the standard? This standard that you are desperately trying to meet up with, what spirit drives it? You are there now, getting ready to marry, and the thing you are dreaming about is wedding shower. Abi, uh -huh. I don't even know what they call it. Ah, oh, Jesus, bridal shower is a body, a body. So if the Lord sends you a brother that does not have money to do bridal shower, you will now put him under pressure. And you will be doing this thing with holy anger. You will try to spiritualize it. God did not call us to look shabby, bro. Hear me. That you did not do bridal shower does not mean your marriage won't succeed. It is the house that is built upon the rock that lasts. The rock. And I'm not against you doing bridal shower if you have money. But me, Kesena, even if I have money, I won't do. <laughs> I won't do. Because unlike you, me, I like to ask questions. Who set the standard? Who set the standard? That thing you are pursuing, did it come from the belly of the spirit? If it's something we have no control over, if it's in a law of the nation, and God demands that every Christian should obey the law of his government, I don't have a question. But if it's something I have control over, I will ask questions. Why? Why? Wedding has turned to competition, even amongst believers. So you will hear Christians who are in church. One is a, a minister. The other one is an usher. The other one is this. And they are staying together without paying bride price. Then when you ask him, when you ask his brother, you say, sir, the problem is that there's no money. Who set the standard? For instance, if I tell you now that you don't need money to marry, you won't believe it. Your first priority for marriage. I'm not saying you will not use money to marry. I say you don't need money to marry. Your first priority for marriage is what is the Lord saying? If the Lord speaks, you will finance it. And the thing you need money for that you are going to use money for. Let me not say need. The thing you are going to use money for is majorly the traditional. Pay the bride price. 
buy the things the family wants and you have married her. Praise the Lord. Yes. And there's nothing wrong that you have finished doing that one and then you come to church on Sunday and I bless you. You are married. No devil in hell. There's nothing wrong. But now you want to marry, you are under pressure for reception. You sit down and you have canceled the paper 600 times. You began with 150 people. You say they go past 150. You have entered 300. They go past 300. You've entered 600. Now you can't sleep in the night. Your blood pressure is high. You want, you want to feed 600 people. If they didn't eat in their house, they can't come and be fed in your wedding. I've told you before of a couple that said, no reception, none. None. And the good thing about it was that they had money. Plenty money. The guy was working in a fine company. The girl was millions. They had money. They said, if you want to do reception, do it in your house. As they closed in church, the guy carried his wife, entered his fine car, and went to. Some people didn't believe. They said, I lie. <laughs> they go share the food. Wait. I lie. They stayed there and the man and his wife had gone home. It was their friends that gathered and I said, no, we must do a party for you. He said, if you want to spend your money, but my own money is not for reception. The reason the average believer is under pressure is Babylon. And one of the reasons God calls you to consecrate yourself unto him, he wants to free you from that spirit. Because the Bible calls it a spirit that is at work in the children of disobedience. He wants to save you from that spirit. Because one of the tenets of consecration is that your eyesight is fixed on one person. Fixed. You live to serve his will. Consecration is not that you are trying to make a sacrifice for God. No, no, no. Consecration is a posture of honor. You consider it an honor and a privilege that God will choose you to serve his will. Consecration is not about you giving to God. Consecration is about you waiting on the Lord. And that word waiting comes from the Hebrew and the Greek for serve. The word serve as translated in scriptures means to wait on God. So when the Bible says that priests are called to minister unto the Lord, what that means is that they are called to wait on him. Babylon will take your personal ambitions and make it look legitimate. But Babylon knows that as long as your eyes are not fixed on Jesus, your destination to Zion will never be successful. This is why, dear brother, the Bible says it is he that endures to the end. Bro, what that means is that some people won't make it to the end. Why? They came out of Egypt. They received the Holy Ghost. But on their way to Zion, they began to subscribe to other spirits. Other spirits. A brother was telling us in the in the in I think it was Joshua and Marvelous there with me in the room when Benedict was talking about okay, I think you guys are gone. He was telling me about a place in Awuchipoli where um they went to buy a drink for me or something. And then I found out that that place, young girls who dress up, spray perfume, then they go and stand there. Waiting for any man to come and pick them. But that's not where I'm going. Because that's another spirit. That's not Babylon. Babylon is part of that spirit. But the actual spirit driving that one is called Sodom. I'm coming there. Now, what he was telling me was that the thing that shocks everybody is there are videos. These Yahoo boys will take a lady use her for ritual, they will video it. It seems to be part of the requirement. They will video it. You will not see the person who is doing the thing. They will video it. You will see them kill this girl 
and they will put it on social media. He said, one girl was talking one time. She said, I must date Yahoo boy. He said, but they're the key girls. He said, no, the one we not get sense, they're the key. He said, get me. I know how to play my game. Why is she insisting she will date a Yahoo boy? Babylon. Because one of the core spirits of Babylon is mammon. The desire for money. Look at it now. Look at it. Okay, go to 18. Go to 18. Re um, Revelations 18. Uh, let's try verse 4. Hmm, where is that verse of scripture? There's a place in 18 that he speaks about all the nations drinking of the cup. 18 what? Three, okay. Aha. Uh -huh. Look at it. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the rot of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth have become what? Through the what? Abundance of her luxury. Mammon. And it's on the basis of this that Paul was giving counsel to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3. That's where we will land shortly. Now, if the believer successfully escapes the spirit of Babylon, the other civilization he will meet is the spirit of Sodom. And what is Sodom? Sodom is sexual perversion. Sexual perversion. And what is a perversion? A perversion is taking something that is legal, that is true, and corrupting it. Sexual perversion. And somebody might be saying, um, Pastor is just speaking. We have seen a scripture on Babylon. Why not a scripture on, okay, let's try. Revelations 8. Let me show you that there are spirit cities. 8, 11, I think. It's not 11. Let me find it. Let me find it. Revelations 8. Oh, Labo Cobra Shata. Bo, 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 Eleven eight. God bless you. Thank you. Not eight eleven. Eleven eight. Thank you. Now the Bible was speaking about the two witnesses who will be killed. We can't deal with that revelation now. I'm watching my time. And he says that their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called what? And where our Lord was also crucified. So these things are spiritual civilizations. And the way you can understand what Sodom represents spiritually is to go and study Sodom and Gomorrah. Like I told you, every civilization will bear the identity of the spirit that governs it. Sodom and Gomorrah was a, was a city of sexual perversion. So when you see an 18-year-old girl whom her mother can give her money for the basic things, uh -huh. She can buy her sanitary things as a girl. Her mother takes care of her to the best of her ability. She has cream and she has pomade, whether it's palm kernel, whether it is dove, at least not cream. She has, she can wear skirt, she can wear blouse, she can wear a normal shoe. But she begins to have a craving for something that she feels her parents cannot provide. And then she feels that her only option is to sell her body. The spirit that is at work is called Sodom. Because I can assure you, there are people, and I know not one, not two, not three, not four. Some have sat in my office crying. I can't pay school fees. Why is it that it never comes to their mind to sell their own body? 
world. It's because this one has chosen to submit to a spirit and that spirit is alive and well in our generation. Sexual perversion. What they've done now is that they have even packaged it in such a way that even Christians are now making excuses for sexual perversion. So you will see a Christian with tongues on his lips telling you that big brother is entertainment. As entertainment. Sodom has successfully got you to sit down and open your spirit to what he is selling. Packaged it. The problem is my generation doesn't ask questions. So you have begun to watch now. You have begun to watch now. And you know the thing about these spirits? They take their time. They will grow with you. Sodom and Babylon won't stop you from speaking in tongues. They will stay, they will stay quiet within your vessel. Allow you to do ga 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 ga. Whole pillar. Sweat for 10 hours. They will allow you. Then one day they will put you in a situation. Somebody will come to buy something in your gas shop. And then the thing is 15,000. You now sell it 25. Then Babylon will rise. And say the remaining 10,000 are your own. You say, me, I don't like money. Oh. But this God that has made this possible. Is it your product you are selling? Babylon will wait. Until your rent is due. You have tried everything you can't pay. Then you will meet one of your friends and say, how much do they find? It's now 150, 150. <laughs> All these church girls. So one man I don't know, I slept with him last week, he gave me 400,000. He said, you don't need to know the man. Nobody will ever find out. Then the girl will go and cry and say, oh God, why are you doing this to me? In those seasons, the voice of the great immortal spirit will be still. Sodom and Babylon will be raging. Will you not be ashamed? They will say that God could not pay your rent. God helps those who help themselves. Do something. Do something. That's how some of you have stolen company money. Allow the man that is not your husband put his hand on your lap. And heaven weeps. Priests that are supposed to be consecrated have become meat for strange spirits. Those whom he has chosen that bear his name. Do you know the consecration level required for a priest? As part of his dress code on his taban, taban, was written, separated unto God. That's what holiness unto God means. I'm separated unto God. But Babylon and Sodom will lure you. Lure you. The challenge with my generation is that we think consecration is suffering. We think that it is failures that sell their lives to God. So we are afraid if I give him everything, it will look like I'm failing. What a way to fail. If men call me a failure because I've decided to wait on God, then that failure will be a badge of honor. A badge of honor. But I will not bow to the mount of lions. I will not bow to the fiery furnace. I will not bow to the spirit of Sodom. My destination is the mount of God. And I might stumble and fall on the way. There may be days where my strength will fail. Where it will look as if I feel abandoned. But I am not cast down. I am not forsaken. I will feel crushed. 
the weight of my expectations will be heavy upon me. I've graduated for many years and yet I can't find a job but I would rather go to Zion. It's where the spirits of just men made perfect and manifest. I would rather go to Zion. It's called the church of the firstborn. It's a company of priests. It's a company of priests. Men whom the spirit of Babylon has no hold over their soul. Sodom has no hold over their soul. There's only one spirit to which they submit. He's called the great immortal spirit. And in his name is the acronym of the priest. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. That means when you bring this spirit amongst other spirits, is a spirit that is separated, pure, clean. But my generation is afraid of consecration. So Paul began to give Timothy counsel. In 2 Timothy verse 3, verse, chapter 3, verse 1, he now says, this is the way you will know you have come into the end of the age. In the end of the age, one of the first things you will find is that men, men. Go to verse 2. Men will be lovers of themselves. Self-worship. What is the first commandment? Huh? First commandment. Love him with all your heart. The Lord thy God. Love him, serve him. But what these spirits do is that they make you the object of your own worship. What to eat. What to drink. What to put on. So taking your eyes from God, you now make yourself priority. That's why the average Christian can't give to God. The average Christian cannot maintain basic disciplines of prayer, of Bible study. My sleep, my money, my body, my time. Oh, 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 you don't know who a priest is. A priest no longer has anything that is his own. Anything that he's given, he, he considers it a privilege. All of his life has become that that belongs to another. Oh. Give me Deuteronomy 10, 8 and 9. Deuteronomy 10, 8 and 9. At that time, the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord, to do what? Minister to him. And to what? Bless his name. To this day. Somebody will say, but that has ended in Old Testament. The reason this day is still valid is just as Aaron was the high priest. Jesus is our high priest. As Aaron's sons and brothers were part of the priesthood, every one of us are part of the messianic priesthood. So that priesthood that was a type in Aaron has become a fulfillment in Jesus. So the Bible says that we have not a high priest that cannot be touched by the feelings of our infirmities. He is our high priest. And every one of us line up as priests before him. The Bible says in Revelations that he had made us kings and priests. And we shall do what? Reign upon the earth. Revelations 5.10 And we shall reign upon the earth. So the priority of the priest is that he's to minister. Let me show you something. Come. Come. Let me leave pastors. Two of you come. Let me bring one sister. Obulum, come. Stand around me. Stand around me. One there. One behind. Let one, one person be here. Bless him. Come out. Aha. Stand around me. Let me show you the picture of what it means to minister unto the Lord. In this posture, the priest recognizes that 
he is to wait on the king. So in this post, everyone is around the king waiting for his instructions. He can tell this one, I have sent you as a missionary to Eku. And that one goes with joy. Recognizing that the reason he is a priest in the first place is to serve the will of the king. He can say to this one, I have made you a teacher in a secondary school and she goes there. Go to the secondary school. He can say to this one, I am sending you as a, a, an apostle in the oil and gas and he goes there. Then this one will be wondering, what about me? He says, wait. Wait. And while he's waiting, years are passing. People say he's failing, but the king says, minister unto me. I am the center of attraction. This is why the Bible says we do not compare ourselves one with another. Peter saw John the beloved following. He said to Jesus, what about him? Jesus said, what is your business? You follow me. The man can be there waiting. But he's not waiting in anger. He's waiting with joy. What a privilege to serve. What a privilege to wait. Ah, the Lord considers me faithful enough to stay, stay, and I'm ready to stay. What happens most of the time in modern day Christianity? This man begins to look at that man. Look at him. He says, a senior, a first and graduate. He's already in share. God, why are you doing this to me? Then Sodom will make him look at the other one. She's a teacher. But yes, she's married. She has children. Her husband has bought her a car. He said, so I'm not qualified to have a wife. Now me and God called to suffer. He looks at the other man. He said, ah, I've been begging God for anointing. Look at that one. He's a preacher. Lord, why are you keeping me here? And then Babylon will, will latch on his soul. And tell him, walk away. So the Lord begins to weep in heaven. I sought for a man. And I found none. There were many in church on Sunday morning. Many people came for service. But none was waiting on me anymore. They don't know how to wait again. They are always in a hurry. Babylon has a standard. Sodom has a standard. Everywhere there is a standard. So men are afraid to wait. They feel that if they wait, they will waste. But if you waste for Jesus. In Zion, there will be crowns for men that wasted. In Zion, we will not be the same. I tell you for free. In Zion, when we get to the city of the Lord, we will not be the same. There will be crowns for men that knew how to wait on the Lord. To wait. Consecration is waiting on the Lord. Sit down, brethren. It's ministering to his needs. Surrendering your ambitions. And waiting. If he tells you to just stand there and be jumping, you'll be jumping with joy. Jumping with joy. Because consecration is not that you are doing God a favor. It's that you are honoring him with your life. What God is looking for is vessels. He can't find vessels. I was telling them in Aunchi yesterday, that is it not sad? We need to close. Is it not sad? That Babylon has vessels. Babylon. There are young people even in church. That are willing to sell their lives and their soul to Babylon. Willingly. No pressure. Sodom has vessels. Vessels are bound to Sodom. I've wept certain times. When people have told me how they entered into lesbianism and homosexuality. Some of them. The plague came from within the church. They were not afflicted outside. It's somebody who had tongues. Who had the name of the Lord. That began to abuse them. If it happened outside. I will understand that it's outside. Outside there are wolves. 
But when we come into this company of priests, every man is supposed to be a sheep. But in a company like this, lesbians have crept into our company. Abusing our sisters. Homosexuals have crept in. Abusing our brothers. Now, I wept when they were telling me how a man of God told a sister that the way to honor is to honor her pastor with her body. That is one of the, one of the levels of honor. One clown even took it a, a, a step further. He's somewhere in this country. No need to name names. He, when, the girl, when girls join the church, when they join the church, the ladies in the church have partnered with their, with their man of God. Sisters, if you are coming to the tent and you know that a man is not a man of God and you are aiding and abetting him, your judgment is this year. I promise you, as one of his custodians in this city, I promise you, your judgment and you will dance naked in public. I, I tell you for free. You know that this man is not a man of God and you are aiding him to abuse other sisters. You will dance naked. With everything on my head, I tell you for free. I have wept at his altar. I tell you because I've seen too many young girls suffer. And his other women and other women, girls that are aiding them. Aiding these wizards, these wicked men. These women will carry the girl once she meets Pastor Speck and put her into protocol. So that she can be near Pastor. Then Pastor will begin to work on her for three months. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. You, I know you like all those kind of messages. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. Then the guy told her that his father in the Lord is the great apostle Ayo Babalola. Then one day the girl was just at home. She received a text message. And the name of the sender was Ayo Babalola. And in the text message he said, whatever your spiritual father tells you to do, do it. Mm. And then she received the text message. Three days later, the man of God called her and said, hmm, the way you will honor me is to give me your virginity. Give me your body. So she had received the text. You know Ayo Babalola used to use MTN in glory. She had received a text that had worked on her mind. The girl said, not yesterday, the girl said, when he slept with her, he put the pictures of great men of God in our city on the bed. It was on those pictures he disvirgined her. On those pictures. Oh no. Oh no. You know the challenge? My generation thinks that people like us are bad. He huh. says, in those days, men shall be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money. Posters. Proud. A proud man is not only one that carries shoulder. Somebody that is exposed to truth consistently and refuses to change is proud. Look at it. Second Timothy 3, that's where I am now, please. Three verse two. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, and this is where I want to stop. Unholy. No longer separated. You cannot tell the living from the whole lump anymore. My brother, do you remember that parable? The Bible says, while men slept, the enemy came and sold us. And then when they woke up in the morning, the reaper said, Master, let's approach it. He said, no, leave them, let them grow together. He said, let them grow together. Because in an attempt to uproot the tars, you might also uproot the wheat. Say, let them grow together. He said, but in the day of harvest, 
there will now be a clear separation. A clear separation. I tell you for free, this is the year of harvest. Uh, I, t- I tell you for free. I've been telling you, we have come to the threshing floor. In this year, it will be clear between the unholy and the holy, the sacred and the secular, the clean and the unclean. And if it be that you are a priest and you have decided to corrupt the priesthood, may this year be your year of repentance. I will wait on you, Almighty God, in the beauty of your home. I will worship you, Almighty God, in the beauty of your I will wait on you, Lord. I will wait.
voice now and tell him, Lord, I will wait on you. I am consecrated unto you. My life is yours. All that I am, all that I have. I am yours. It is a privilege to serve the will of my king. I consider it a privilege to serve the will of my king. Come on, I thought you would pray. I know this is not, these are not popular prayer points. But eventually you notice that Sodom, Babylon are still at work in your life. Can you go to God and tell the Lord, I renounce that spirit. I reject that spirit. I refuse that spirit. I am yours. I am yours. I will wait on you in the beauty of your holiness. Can you begin to prophesy to yourself? I am separated unto the Lord. I am separated unto the Lord. Not just today. Not just this week, not just this month, not just this year, all my days, all my years, all my life. No glory in this world. No great name here for me. No glory in this world. My great reward is you. I wouldn't trade you for good. Your presence is my love. My goal is to see your face. And here you see well done. No glory in this world. No great name here for me. No glory in this world. My great reward is you. I wouldn't trade you for good. Your presence is my love. My goal is to see your face. And to hear you see well done. Singing the song of saints till I reach my home. Ba 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 
anybody meanwhile you are here tonight and while I was speaking the Lord began to convict you that you have broken the, the vows of your consecration of your consecration.
God's sakes, till I reach my home. Hallelujah. I'll keep chanting the chant of saints till I reach my home. In the name of Jesus. Lastly now, before I sit down. While I was speaking, this is not everybody. This is not everybody. There were some of you, your priesthood flashed before your eyes. And the Lord began to tell you that you have broken the vows of your consecration. And you want to renew tonight. You want to accept that privilege to wait on the Lord. And this time you want to mean it. Whether they are storms, whether they are rain, whether they are precious. You want to tell the Lord that you will not have scorned again. Wherever you are, come now. Come. and you talk to Jesus you know what you need to tell him you don't need me to tell him you know what he was telling you while I was speaking talk to him now talk to him now from here, they rise strengthened. Wherever there has been a struggle with service unto you, with sacrifice for you, with making the necessary decisions that they need to make, Lord, as they rise now, they are overwhelmed with your spirit. Lord, I feel your anointing on my hand. There are one or two of them that you want to give a sign with an anointing. Lord, can you help me? Touch one, touch two. As a sign that you have answered our prayers. At the count of five. At the count of five. Let it come strong. Strong. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. It's an anointing. It's an anointing. 